There we go. So, <clears throat> either a dream is a good tiding or a warning, or when a righteous person sleeps, the angels take that ruh. Just like when a person dies, what happens? The angels will take the ruh and take it to all the way up to the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that the, the ruh over there will do sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then his ruh is brought back to his body. May Allah make us amongst them. In the same way, when a person goes to sleep, the salih person, the good person, his ruh is taken by the good angels. And they give him the good news. They give him the good news. This is why I connected that ayah. Those people who say, we have istiqama. Because when you are at that level, you will have very spiritual dreams. So, The angels come down to them. They say, Look, keep doing what you're doing. Don't worry about what others are saying. And have this is the Bishab. So, one is at the time of death, you get to see the angels. One is in the day of judgment, you'll get to see the angels. One is when you're going to sleep, then the angels will come to you and give you good news and and even some companions of the Prophet, for example, before they died, they saw, you know, some, some idea of Jannah, for example, just before they died, and so on and so forth. So, a righteous soul goes up and is taken by the angels. A bad soul is soul that is, you can say, impure soul, or the, the heart is impure. Then it is affected by shaitan. Then shaitan is giving the dreams. Shaitan is giving the dreams. And the shaitan is putting ideas in his mind and dreams in his mind and then he wakes up with those ideas and affected by those ideas and so on and so forth. So this, uh, this is what's happening when a person goes to sleep. So now coming back to the, this is just something small I had to say. But when, so how do you interpret the dreams? There are two methods. One is the method of Imam Ibn Salim, which is that when you look at the dream, you look at it from the perspective of the symbolisms. For example, I'll give you another example. There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, narrated by Uthman radiallahu anhu. Uthman radiallahu anhu, he had this dream. Or actually one other sahabi in the khilafah of Uthman radiallahu anhu, he had this dream. But they see a dream in which the Abu Bakr is, uh, the Prophet is holding onto a rope, and then Abu Bakr is holding onto a rope, and then Uthman is holding onto a rope, and Ali is holding onto the rope. What is the rope? The Quran. In another dream, for example, the Prophet ﷺ, so, so you see, you look at the dream from the perspective of how Quran sees that dream. What's, so to be able to do that, the more Quran you know, the better you will be able to understand what the dream is trying to say. The, the less you know of the Quran, the more chances are you're not going to be able to figure out what really Allah is warning for you from or what He's encouraging you towards that you go in this direction, so on and so forth. So, in the same way, there's another hadith, for example, uh, the hadith about honey. Okay, Honey, one of the qualities of honey is what? Shifa, right? And one of the qualities of Qur'an is also Shifa on Imam al-Sudur. So a companion of the Prophet ﷺ, he saw, he saw a dream of honey, and uh, I think it was Abu Bakr, or one of the companions of the Prophet, that told him the honey is representative of the Qur'an. Again, same thing. So, the, because, and this is one of the miracles of Qur'an, because dreams are, dreams are, you can say the ruh is connected to the world, to the next world, to the alim al-amr, to the other world. And the Qur'an is also coming from that other world. So the Qur'an is the key to unlock the dreams. You look at the symbolism within Qur'an, you look at the general, okay, but there are also differences. For example, uh, <clears throat> if you see, now there are some dreams that are like, they, they may not be very, they may be depending upon the situation. I'll give you an example. If a pious person sees a certain dream, it may be a good thing. And if a impious person sees a dream, it will be a bad thing. I'll give you an example. Generally in the dreams, okay, if you see a woman, a female, what does it represent? What does a female represent? Huh? 
dunya, right? Even the Prophet said dunya will be coming in the form of an ugly female, right? But if a pious person has a dream and he sees a beautiful woman, it can mean dunya, but it also can mean one of the hurul na'im, one of the women in the garden. You are doing good and this is going to be your reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you keep going on this. So depending upon who the person is, how pious he is, his profession, the season it is. Because for example, uh, you find for example, uh, you see a, a general fruit. A general fruit. A, a fruit is a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing. But what did Maryam see? She fraught, saw fruits out of the out of the season. Now when a pious person sees a dream with fruits out of the season, it has a different meaning. That connects with Maryam But when a not so pious or impious person has a dream of fruits out of the season, it means something is not in order. There's some sort of, what? Disharmony. There's some sort of in, uh, lack of harmony in the person's uh, life somewhere. He's going after something that doesn't exist. So, you look at the dream from the perspective of the Qur'an. But it also depends how pious this person is. It also depends what his profession is. It also depends upon so many of these factors. Okay? And to interpret the dream, you have to know the Qur'an. And this is why the Prophet wasallam, you know, after every... Why would they... Even though Abu Bakr was a master of interpreting the Qur'an, the Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, he had many skills, many talents, and this was one of them. He was great at interpretation of the uh, dreams. But they used to sit down after every Fajr Salah in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, and the companions used to give the Prophet, they used to tell the Prophet the dreams. Because the dreams are either Bishara or warnings. And they would want to know what is, what is happening in the other world that is giving us signs. You know, this is why you will find a hadith, uh, for example, a companion of the Prophet ﷺ waking up in the morning and saying, Asbahtu mu'minan. You know, I woke up like a true mu'min because something happens in a person's dream or some experience because a lot of uh, reaching the level of ihsan, part of reaching the level of ihsan is to have a certain experience. Reaching the level of ihsan means having a certain what? Experience. If you know all the rational ayat, you rationally know all the ayat, but it's not giving you some experience, then you've missed the point. Right? If it's not moving something inside you, then you miss the whole point. So something coming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all about experience in the end of the day. Worship Allah as if you see Him. This is an experience. So this is why Imam Ghazali he came to the same conclusion. He said that it is, in the end of the day, it's not rational. It's not rational, in his opinion. You know, uh, in his book that he wrote, Deliverance from Error, an uh, 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 I think that's the name of the book, uh, in which he said that, you know, at the end of the day, it's the experience that you have. What experience, and this is why after the time of the Imam Ghazali, the ulama were very strong on trying to help students have a certain type of what? Religious experience, a certain type of religious experience. So that they'll be in that atmosphere where they will have certain type of dreams and so on and so forth. I'm sure all of you people have been at that point in your life where you were like very high and you were having great dreams or very pious dreams. And then, you know, you stay there for a while and then you come down and then maybe you go up or maybe you go down. You all have had situations like that, right? So, you know what I'm talking about. But those, those aspects, they have a permanent effect upon your psyche and, and the way that you look at the world around you. It's another thing in this materialistic world, we don't, we're not really that conscious of it. And we try to kind of like deny it in a sense. But in Islam, we don't want anyone to deny the impact of these things like dreams and so on and so forth. In fact, uh, it would be a good idea to wake up and think about what was my dream? What is, what is Allah trying to say to me? It is a tri type of inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why the Prophet said that true dreams are what? One 
70th of prophethood. And in that hadith in which the Prophet says it's 140th of prophethood, the Prophet also relates it with Bishara and Inzar. Okay, so dreams are very, very important. And uh, like for example, maybe many of you may have had dreams of, like for example, signs of the Day of Judgment. I know one person, for example, and then I'll end here today uh, on this issue, but uh, like there was one person who was reading Quran. He was thinking about, should I become Muslim, should I not become Muslim? He was reading Quran and he went, he kept reading, reading, reading. And then as he's reading Quran, he's beginning to have in his dreams, you know, dreams about the Day of Judgment. The whole world is, you know, shaking and it's, the Day of Judgment is here and so on and so forth. And that became a source of him accepting Islam. And this is an event I, that I saw in my life. So the point is that we should be cognizant of our dreams and we should be somewhat cognizant of how to go about and giving some level of interpretation to those dreams. So before I finish, again, there's another hadith also in Sahih Bukhari about dreams, uh, which is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, he saw Umar عنه, drinking a bowl of milk. What did that represent? No. No. Milk. Milk represented... No. According to the hadith, it represented knowledge. Now how do you come to that conclusion? How do you come to the conclusion milk gives you knowledge? from the perspective of method of interpretation. Those of you that were here in the beginning, you know what I mean by method of interpretation. How do you use this method that I discussed to come to the conclusion that milk means knowledge? Huh? What does Allah say about the cow? It gives something what? Khalis. Right? Shiraban. Right? A pure what? Drink. And what does that represent? What is pure what does it mean pure drink? What is that pure what is that pure drink of milk? What is it called in the Quran? What is that drink? What is that whole scene the Quran makes about the stomach of the cow that makes the milk out of from the khabis it uh, takes away the bad and from that it takes the good and then the milk comes and it is something khalis, something pure for you. So what is, what is it trying to say? It's what? It's an ayah. It's what? An, an ayah for you. Huh? Shariban. But what's the next word? Shariban nil? Yeah, so it means what? What does it mean? Pure. Pure. Purity. Okay, but what else? But I mean, yes, it's pure. Okay, 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 I got it. What does it mean to drink something pure? That ayah is saying that this event that happens where Allah takes out the milk is an ayah for you. It is a what? What is an ayah? It's a sign for you. It's a miracle for you. It's knowledge for you. It's written for you. So when you're drinking the milk, you're drinking something, what? Pure. You're drinking, like, understanding the ayat of Allah. The khabis has been taken away, and something pure is coming into you. Right? So, this is, this is how, and again, this hadith about the milk fits better with the Imam Shaulullah Muhaddas Dilmi Rahmatullah's method. The second method I talked about. So sometimes you have to look at a dream and say, Okay, will I go with Imam Ibn Salim's method of dream interpretation looking at the symbols of Quran or will I use the word Ta'wilul Ahadith itself to come to some conclusion? And then of course the biggest is that if the prof the next way in that learning how to do dream interpretation is also seeing the Prophet's interpretation itself. But you're using certain method to see how the Prophet came to this conclusion. So, uh, so okay, so what the four dreams that we talked about in Sultan Yusuf. The first one was with the 12, suns, uh, 12 stars, sun and moon. What type of dream is that? Purely what? You have inanimate objects that become human, right? But the main aspect there is light. 
Light is guidance, right? Ya abati inni ra'aytu ahada ashra kawkaba wa shamsa wal qamar ra'aytahum li sajidin. Okay. Then, so in that, you had a purely metaphorical dream that needed a purely metaphorical response. Okay. So the type of, the more metaphorical it is, the more metaphorical the dream is, the more metaphorical you have to look at the Qur'an to get to the answer. Because like I said, stun, stars and moons in the Qur'an, these represent human beings. In the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, like the Prophet said, as sahabi kan najum, like I mentioned. My companions are like stars. So the second dream was what? Second dream was the, the, the person's head and the animal, right? So in that you're looking at it, is it halal animals or haram animals? So that is now less metaphorical and coming to the level of the sharia itself. So the sharia, the halal and haram of Islam will tell you if a dream is good or bad. If you see something khabiz, then it is what? Bad. If you see something uh, not khabiz, like let's say tayyib, uh, something good and pure, then it is good. Right? This is what the sharia dictates. So if, you, if this person he saw a dream of a, of a haram animal eating from its head, it meant that this person is, has a very bad luck coming to him. Okay. The third, so the first one is the most metaphorical. Okay. The second is now coming less metaphorical because you, it, you can use the rules of Sharia itself to make an interpretation of what it's trying to say. And the third dream is the man, he is squeezing the grapes. And it is what it is. It is what it is. He is doing exactly that. He's going to go to the king and he's going to squeeze the grapes and make uh, out, uh, uh, you know, beer out of it and he will drink. So the first dream is metaphorical. You, it's hard to predict. But you can use Quran and Sunnah to predict what it's saying. The second dream, you can just use only the Sharia itself to predict what it, the dream means. The third one, even more clear, it is what it is. There was no need for any... Uh, uh, dream interpretation per se to, to figure out it, the dream meant what it was. Okay? Now, the question is that how, now the fourth dream, which is the dream of the of the cows, of the king. Now, that is again metaphorical. That again is what? But not so metaphorical. Because there were how many cows? Seven cows, fat cows, thin cows, it's pretty much within the realm of not exactly clear, but not very unclear either. Okay? So, there are a lot of other questions, but I just want to mention some things very quickly. The Prophet ﷺ said, bil The true dreams are the ones that happen at the time of suhoor. Those are the most true dreams. Okay. Second, true dreams... They happen quickly. There's no storyline that he went from here and then he went there and then he turned into another dream and then it went to another dream. There's no storyline. A true dream comes, it gives you the picture in a few, you could say minutes maybe, maybe a few seconds, and I don't know how the experience is for the human mind, but you have some dream and then the dream, it has a start and an end and it's very vivid, it's very clear and you wake up with that uh, dream in your mind uh, and there's no story there's no long dreams are not true dreams they are what we call mixed dreams there may be some truth in there something from shaitan something from the angel something from uh, Bishara something of Anzar maybe something from your food maybe something from your anxiety so these uh, this is you know this is just a mixture of different things that have come together and so the other thing the Prophet ﷺ said that dreams after Fajr are from Shaitan. Dreams after Fajr are from Shaitan. This is a general rule. It doesn't have to always be true. Somebody can have a true dream after Fajr also. Like if he prayed the Hajjud all night and then he prayed, went to sleep after Fajr. So he may have a true dream at that time also. So, and then of course, there's also uh, the, the, the issue of... Uh, as far as uh, dream interpretation is concerned, uh, like I said, there's, there's a few other factors, but I won't go into that today. 
but I do want you to know is the method that is used to do what? To do dream interpretation. So this is some of the things that if you go to, this is why reading Ayat al Kursi before you go to sleep. So that shaitan will not interfere in your dream. And so the angels will be able to give you a good dream, you can say. A dream that will encourage you. This is why reading Ayat al Kursi or some Quran or doing some Adhkar before you go to sleep. So that the angels, they will be able to better, better you know, the angels can in, help you have a better dream instead of shaitan coming there. So the only reason of reading Ayat al Kursi and other adhkar before going to sleep is not just so that you will be protected in the physical sense, but also that your ruh will be also protected. You see, your ruh will also be protected at that time. And then, <coughs> so, inshallah, we'll just end here, inshallah. أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين والمسلمات جزاكم الله خير. If there are any questions, I'll answer any questions, inshallah, on the issue of dream interpretation. Should I stop it?